So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Carlos Paradi, and I'll be moderating uh, today's session. Um, so yes, I think people are all starting to coming in. So let's just start. Let me share my screen here. Properly, yes. So um, today's headline speaker is um, Professor Lynette Chea. Uh, so she's an associate professor of engineering systems at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, and where she directs the Sustainable Urban Mobility Research Laboratory, which focuses on, wait, sorry about that. You have like the captions on, that's no, good. Uh, where she directs a sustainable urban mobility research laboratory that focuses on data-driven approaches um, to reduce environmental impact of passengers and freight transport. She's also a member of Singapore's Public Transport Council and an associate editor of the Journal of Industrial Ecology. She has also served as a review editor for the uh, IPCC six assessment report that examines climate change mitigation approaches in transportation sectors. And she has engineering degrees from Northwestern, Stanford, and MIT. So that's an amazing curriculum right there. And uh, today's presentation is going to be about decarbonizing the freight transport sector. So demand for global freight transfer is expected to grow more than three times by 2050. And uh, associated greenhouse gas emissions will increase faster than passenger transport. So while road vehicles currently dominate the global transportation uh, related CO2 emissions, uh, road freight is considered to be a uh, harder to abate sector. So Professor Shah will review options to decarbonize uh, road freight and discuss challenges and opportunities. Um, so I think you can all read the abstract right here, and I think I don't want to spend more time in this and just go straight to the presentation today. So, Lynette, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giancarlos. And um, hello, everyone, from, from calling in from many different places. So it's good to see and hear from all of you today. Uh, thank you to Kara, Nida, Eli, Mehmet, Giancarlos, and the team for organizing and inviting me to, to this conference. Uh, I think it's, it's great that it's such an inclusive and, and low-carbon option to have. I um, also want to congratulate the organizing team for the fourth run of BTR, so it, it's great to know how it has thrived uh, all, all, all these years. So yes, today I'm going to share with you a bit more about decarbonizing uh, freight transportation. So I hope you can see my screen looking fine now. Yeah? Yes, we can okay. see it. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I mean, well, it's considered harder to abate uh, in terms of emissions from this uh, transport sector. Um, I think that's because we tend to focus a, a lot on technologies, uh, but there are many options other than technologies, and I hope that today's presentation will guide you through some of the options that are, are available. So I hope that we'll have time at the end for some discussion, so please feel free to uh, put in uh, questions in the chat or, or chime in at the end. So as uh, Giancarlos has kindly inter introduced, uh, I'm, I'm Lynette, I'm from Singapore, and I grew up in Singapore, I studied in the US before coming back to Singapore. And uh, my team's research interests are in sustainable mobility, transport modeling and simulation, just like many of you, uh, life cycle assessments, and the topic of urban metabolism or the resource stocks and flows in cities. So I'm, I'm here today and I, I welcome uh, questions and discussion. So today I'll cover four, uh, um, we'll cover four topics uh, around this topic of decarbonizing freight transport. I think freight transport um, is, is known for many names, right? City logistics, urban logistics, urban goods movements. And it's a very fascinating space as I have discovered in the past a few years working on this. Um, so I'll introduce the context of freight, uh, some of the associated emissions today, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that I think can be looked into. Uh, this framework of decarbonizing freight, avoid, shift, improve, whether or not it's relevant and some of the aspects of uh, this, this, this goal or vision. So this freight transport system, I think we're all beneficiaries and part of it, right, driving a lot of the movements uh, that, that surround uh, goods moving around. Uh, it could be moving around, around cities, moving around the world. It's a very uh, complex system with many different moving parts, agents, and interests. Uh, it's a very critical one that really enables commerce today and, and modern life as we, as we understand it to be. So it's made up of different vehicle types, uh, different modes, different infrastructure that we rely on, like the, uh, the networks, the road networks, uh, the air links, and um, things like the warehouses, depots, and so on. And then there's many different agents with different roles and responsibilities. We have the shippers, the carriers, the receivers, and also the consumers, right, that are drawing uh, the goods to, towards them. 
So very, again, very fascinating space that some of you might already be working. Here's a map of Singapore. I thought I will frame uh, the freight context in Singapore too for um, just to you know, frame it as an example of a city, but this would be true of, of, of many of the cities. Most of the case studies that I will talk of today would surround the Singapore case study because that's where I am based, but I think it can be relevant to, to your city or the cities that you are familiar with as well. So here's a map of Singapore, a small island state, and um, we have the ports on the uh, east and the west side. So we have the airport on the east. Some of you have visited Singapore, might have come in through uh, this, this way. And then we have the seaports in the south, and they are receiving goods, people, um, goods, and well, the airport receives people too. Uh, we have the causeway. These are the land links to, to the peninsula of Malaysia. And then the, this is where we get our goods from as well. And then we have the arteries, right, that link these sites of where goods come in or where they are produced to consumers. And that's, that's, that's the existence of the freight system, right? We need to move it from, uh, I need to cover this distance um, uh, that, 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 that splits uh, where sites of production with sites of consumption. So it, you know, this transport and storage industry contributes a non-trivial part of the, the country's uh, GDP, a gross domestic product, 6.53% back in 2018 a sizable sum of, of, uh, of, of money um, and, 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 and activity and really drives a lot of uh, economic activities. So um, just to allude again to the complexity involved, uh, when we did a survey with firms or establishments about what commodities are handled by them, uh, we see a lot of movements from business to businesses as well as uh, between the business and consumers. So if we look at the different industry types in the middle, bars over here, transport and storage, manufacturing, wholesale, we can see that they would bring in all sorts of different commodity types, and then there'll be all sorts of different outbound shipments too, at different volumes, different frequencies, different um, sites. So again, very fascinating, very fascinating space. So while all this activity is taking place, we are concerned with the impact on global emissions. And we know that transport is a main contributor to global emissions. So if we look at the split or how we can uh, uh, where, where global emissions comes from. Uh, transport is responsible for about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So these are, this is information from uh, 2019, a total of estimated 59 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. So that's a metric we use to measure carbon emissions. If we split that up, uh, road transport is a dominant one. Uh, so road, road transport is the main part of total global, uh, uh, total transport emissions. Uh, Rail is still a small fraction, 3%, aviation, 12%, growing, shipping, 11%, and then others, 6%. And if you were to dissect this road transport again to passenger versus freight, you can see that you know, freight is responsible, again, for non-trivial non part of it all. So uh, I think it's very good to consider targeting freight movements um, to, in order to curb overall transport greenhouse gas emissions. Um, freight emissions are expected to grow, as was mentioned in the in the abstract. I think the, the expectations is to grow more than four times by 2050. And it's becoming a lot more complex to organize and, and plan for. Uh, international freight transport takes place over much longer distances now. And this also generates a considerable greenhouse gas emissions. The complex, uh, the supply chains are becoming more complex, uh, maybe less efficient and more carbon intensive. So again, these are the areas of concern that we would like to try to address. If we track the growth in CO2 emissions, uh, one thing about the, the, pre uh, the previous chart, we can see what modes are responsible for what aspects of emissions, but we also know that over time, this emissions is, is, is growing very rapidly, right? And um, a lot of the uh, solutions and actions to reduce uh, emissions are really trying to overcome this, this growth that's happening. So if we get, again, if we look at the different uh, modes, types, and, and uh, which one that experienced the highest growth, most of the growth has have come from uh, pass, uh, both passenger as well as uh, freight vehicles on, on roads. So uh, since this, these modes are you know, quite, uh, uh, well, well, actually all modes are do dominated by the use of fossil fuels, but um, the activity levels are very high for, for road vehicles. So ultimately reliant on uh, road vehicles to get us the goods that we're, we're looking for. And as to where much of the growth is, is happening and is driven by, I think 
Uh, you might have seen a map like that. It's quite interesting. Uh, this map is a global world map, and it shows this little circle in the in, uh, based in Asia. And then we know that population density is very high in this particular spot, in this particular part of the world. So there are more people actually living in this circle than outside uh, of, of the circle and, and growing. So, so Asia has experienced the highest increase in transport CO2 emissions uh, among all the different world regions from 2010 to 2019. So a lot of, uh, it's, it's like a hype of activity that, that's, that's only going to grow yeah, even more in the coming years. Yeah. Um, part of freight transport, many people would think of e-commerce. E-commerce is not the only part of it, but has grown a lot uh, in, in recent years, right? I think over the pandemic, more people are shopping online or more likely to shop online now, introdu introduced to online shopping. So same thing in, in Southeast Asia. This is a chart that shows the size of the Southeast Asian e-commerce market growing uh, rapidly. Um, and much of, the, much of this is driven by the emergence of a growing middle class. So growing affluence would allow them to uh, allow, allow many there to buy more things. Uh, the growth in internet connectivity and penetration helps also as, a, as an enabler. And then these um, social commerce <laughs> will provide some uh, online mar marketplaces to, to, again, enable the possibility of shopping online. It's becoming yeah, easier, right? very accessible. And maybe it's also driven by this lack of physical retail infrastructure in some places that would drive many to turn to online avenues or channels to get what they are looking for. Um, I, I like to look at pictures. So I'm going to put up some pictures here to show you know, this activity surrounding e-commerce in some of the Southeast Asian countries around uh, uh, in this region. So we see a warehouse in Indonesia. Uh, we see how there's uh, lots of very small uh, logistic service providers or carriers doing deliveries. Like in Vietnam, we see this picture of a cash on delivery option, um, which uh, also has a lot of interesting uh, payment related uh, businesses around, around that. Uh, delivery services in the Philippines. Uh, we see some electric delivery bikes among traffic in Thailand. And then you know, in Singapore too, a lot of activity. This is a, a company called, called Ninja Van that does a lot of e-commerce uh, deliveries in, in the city. So maybe in your city too, you might find some of this a very familiar, familiar site. Um, so we have an understanding of uh, the essential, how critical this uh, freight system is, uh, you know, the contributions to carbon emissions. There are also some challenges and opportunities surrounding freight transport. So in cities in particular, some of the challenges surround the use of space or the use of land for um, different purposes, including transport, right? So it's starting to compete and then becoming a, a contention, uh, resource contention issue. Uh, there's evidence of inefficiencies in goods deliveries. Uh, so let me show some evidence of that shortly. The industry is quite fragmented. So there are many different players, again, different sizes, each one doing uh, their own little thing, optimized within themselves, but not necessarily optimized on a system level. Uh, data is something that I think many researchers, transport researchers can relate to. So there's, uh, um, they tend to be very proprietary or um, uh, you know, uh, more like little, little islands of information that you can uncover, but does not reveal what you're looking for on, on a system level. So let me show you some uh, observations and that, that we've had about freight goods movement in, in this city. So um, if we look at key goods receiving locations, so in, in this case, we're looking at a, a shopping area, sorry, excuse me, uh, a shopping area in Singapore. When you are a shopper, you go up to a building and you see, you know, it's a very glossy, uh, very nice consumer facing uh, building. But then when you look at the the back end, uh, the, the back of the building, that's where most of the, the trucks would be, would be hanging out. And um, they would have uh, long queues to, to experience, uh, maybe illegally, they have to park illegally too if the loading bay is not available. So the bottom left picture shows the congestion that might happen and the conflict with, with uh, even some passenger vehicles. There's a taxi trying to do an illegal maneuver there. So we have, <clears throat> what we tried to do was make these observations at some of these malls in this shopping belt in Singapore called Orchard Road. So if some of you have visited uh, Singapore before, so there's lots of malls there. And um, at each of these malls, we sort of tried to track the truck arrivals coming to make these goods deliveries uh, over, over the course of the day. So the vertical 
uh, this matrix in the bottom right shows uh, different malls as, as uh, each one in one horizontal line, uh, one row. And then the columns are the timestamps from 6 a.m. in the morning to 10 p.m. in the evening. Uh, what we observed was that they tend to come during the mall opening hours, which is sensible, right? Because that's when the stores open, they make their deliveries fresh, uh, fresh deliveries. However, this very much also conflicts with pedestrian, uh, sorry, passenger movements. So this is when people come to the mall. So this conflict again with, with passenger cars come, come into play. Um, so yeah, so we see a lot of midday deliveries around lunchtime, uh, you know, and um, this happens on a daily, daily basis. Um, this evidence of uh, infrastructure overloading is also apparent uh, when we try to track, um, you know, some of some data here. So a lot of the work that my team does, you know, is, is data collection and then using it to develop models and then interpreting impacts. So data is the first step. And when we uh, try to visualize some of the data concerning goods deliveries to these to these retail malls, which are very dense and uh, at, at, at sites of, uh, of urban activity. So people go there to eat, to shop, to meet people. It's a very social uh, environment uh, as well. So this map, uh, this chart here again shows the arrival of goods vehicles over time, over the course of the day, uh, two different malls that we tracked and uh, the green lines or the bottom two lines would show uh, the horizontal line is the capacity or the number of loading bays that the system can accommodate. And then you see the arrivals very quickly exceeding it uh, over the day and very, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, it's a system that is it's clearly not, not designed to accommodate the, the arrivals that, 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 is, uh, that, that are happening. So same thing for the other mall, mall B is the upper, upper blue lines. Uh, you have the capacity exceeded uh, over the uh, dominant part of the day. Um, the data is available under uh, at this website uh, called, called Loading Base. You can actually play around with it, and um, it's also being available through uh, this, this paper that we published. So in case you're doing some research on this, feel free to, to check out the, the data set. Um, other signs of inefficiencies of goods movement, uh, we see competition with passenger, passenger transport. So this, this work was done with uh, one of my former students, Li Wei, who is actually among the audience today, so he can help me answer some questions too. Um, Li Wei is now doing his, his PhD uh, in, in Toronto. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you, Li Wei. So we have, um, we, again, we were uh, had had an opportunity to, opportunity to track 700 over trucks in this city, uh, which actually took a lot of time to to set up this arrangement. But we were able to monitor their uh, their trajectories, monitor their engine status as well. Uh, and then using that information to track where they are, as well as what sort of emissions are, are being, how much fuel and, and emissions are, are, are being released. So the map on the left, the, the graphic just shows the emissions over the, the course of an average weekday. And again, we see this coinciding with passenger transport, right? This competition with passenger transport. They are traveling on the roads at the same time where peak hour travel is happening for passenger transport. Um, and then the chart on the right shows idling. So this is something that surprised us too when we tracked these vehicles. So this is uh, you know, distribution of the different vehicles and how much time they, they idle, uh, you know, with a percentage of time spent idling shown on the vertical axis. So um, idle time on average is about 50 over percent, which is, is quite high. I think when we try to probe a little bit more, I think sometimes the, the driver um, keeps it, keeps the engine on when making deliveries or they keep the engine on for the air conditioning, kind of Singapore is a very hot and humid city, so sometimes they, they, they do that. Um, but yes, so high, high idling tail. Um, they also have seemed to have um, fairly low payloads and a tendency to travel empty. So again, with the same data set, we were able to track, uh, uh, we were able uh, to not only track them, but we also surveyed them on uh, what, uh, what, what cargo they are carrying, as well as uh, what is the, how full the, how full the truck is. So this lading factor is the you know, percentage of the maximum ton, uh, kilo, uh, ton, ton kilometer that it can accommodate um, uh, over the, over the, the shift of, of the vehicle. So average factor seems fairly low. Uh, we split this up by industry just to see the, the trends. So we have here the construction, utilities, transport, manufacturing industry split up. Um, but we will see that in general for, for most of them, this average uh, payload isn't isn't all that all that high. A payload is is not an easy one to, to track. I think we all we're, it's not something that you can measure 
uh, you know, easily or, or sense easily on, on, on a vehicle. So yeah, you either have to observe it or ask the drivers about, about it. Um, we also noticed that you know, there's, uh, we've, we've plotted the empty kilometers traveled. So that's on the, the chart on the right-hand side. Same thing split by industry types. We find that 58% you know, of total distance traveled is empty. Um, well, if you think of truck trips, you know, ideally they will be traveling full one way and then maybe coming back empty, right? So you know, half the time they, they, they would be empty. Um, but, I, but there's still, again, some evidence that not, 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 uh, not always the case. Um, and then here, another evidence of a fragmented industry. So we have the fleet size distribution <clears throat> on the left-hand side. So, <clears throat> so these are the number of firms plotted with the number of vehicles they have in their, in their commercial fleet. So most of them are single vehicle owners. These firms are one company, one vehicle, probably doing their own uh, routing and <clears throat> deliveries for, 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 for that company's needs, um, which may not be, again, might be optimized for themselves, but may not be optimized on, on a city scale. Uh, when we made some observations of deliveries at these malls, and we, we hung out a lot, a lot of the, the back end of back uh, side of malls, and um, when we observed the number of deliveries made by individual carriers arriving. So most of them will only be making one delivery rather than multiple deliveries, right? Which again, could be an indicator of, or show some opportunity for consolidation or, or, or sharing some of these, uh, these trips. So that brings us to the, the opportunities, right? We spoke about some of these challenges and inefficiencies that we're observing, the fragmentation in the industry, but there are also opportunities. You can look at this as, there's lots of room for improvement, so you can uh, we can actually help with, with routing issues, uh, try to help consolidate and, and so on. Um, it's also possible to target some impacts. So what I mean is um, the number of goods vehicles in a city tend to be you know, it is smaller. So this is again in Singapore's case, we have a, a few number, uh, a smaller fraction of the total population of the vehicles are freight vehicles. So um, on the left-hand side, we see this uh, breakdown of vehicle types, um, and then goods and uh, goods vehicles. We call them goods vehicles here. You can, you can call them trucks. You can call them commercial vehicles. Uh, goods vehicles make up about 17% of the vehicle population, and they tend to drive more miles or more kilometers uh, as well. So the chart on the right shows the average annual kilometers traveled per vehicle. So we have the HGVs are the heavy goods vehicles, the larger trucks and light goods vehicles, which are the smaller trucks, and they tend to drive you know, much more than passenger cars. So small vehicle population driving most of the kilometers in the city, I think if we were to target improvements in this smaller set of vehicles, we can potentially have, uh, have a high impact. Um, lots of new technologies and innovations uh, in, in this space. So we can see uh, a lot of activity here, which is actually very interesting. So I, I teach a course on urban transportation at my university, and every year I have to refresh with some new and new new technologies that, that's in, in the in the space now. And there's growing interest in low carbon transport. Uh, you can also think of it as growing pressures, right? In, in in low carbon transport, we have to respond, we have to regulate, and we want to want to do that. Um, so I had the opportunity to be involved with the, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change these past few years. So. Uh, the IPCC puts out many reports, right? And you might have seen some of them. Um, so they usually assemble different task forces or working groups to address the science of climate change, uh, the you know the risks and the impacts. They, they, they do a, they put out a lot of reports summarizing the state of the science in these areas. Uh, and then working group group three is in charge of the mitigation of climate change that came out just recently this year. So you can go take a look. It's quite interesting. Uh, they 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 have a Summary for policymakers, a technical summary, so you can look at it different aspects. So uh, one of the key messages, you know, of the mitigation report is that to limit warming, we need uh, immediate action for rapid and deep emissions reductions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions in all sectors, including transport. Um, so the the message is one of of urgency, and um, related to freight transport, uh, I think I've, I've highlighted a few key takeaways for, for, for this topic for today. It's possible to have greenhouse gas emissions by year 2030 for many sectors, including transport. Uh, the options are around the use of low emissions technologies, as well as demand side measures. Now, demand side measures is interesting, interesting right? So actually in this sixth assessment report, um, this is one of the new additions compared to the previous report. 
So where the previous report focused a lot on technologies, to, uh, this more recent one also focuses on some of the demand side measures. So this concern, uh, the adoption of these low emission technologies, like for transport, electric, uh, electric vehicles, uh, we have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, uh, sustainable biofuels as some of the technical options. Um, so we are looking at, for the demand side concerning uh, more quick, uh, quicker adoption to sort of, um, you know, sort of turn over the fleet more, more quickly or behavioral changes that can potentially reduce travel demand. And then to recognize co benefits of reducing freight emissions. So we know that, you know, if we were to reduce congestion, it has lots of benefits uh, in terms of for the economy, uh, for, for, for the quality of the air around us, human health uh, impacts, uh, social impacts, and, and so on. So recognizing that can also help us maybe motivate the move to decarbonize more, more quickly. So how can we reduce emissions? Uh, I, I like to show this uh, simple equation, right, to, to, to my students. So you have the amount of carbon per unit of fuel, or you know, you try to reduce the fuel per, per unit distance that a vehicle travels, or reduce the distance that a vehicle travels, or the number of vehicles, and then that will get you um, a reduction in overall carbon emissions. So we can interpret this as lower carbon fuels, more efficient vehicles, a more efficient road system, or, or, or freight transport system, or reducing travel demand. Um, another mantra that you might hear of since you're all transport enthusiasts is this avoid, shift, improve approach, right? To reduce emissions, which has been you know, quite, quite uh, commonly put out for, for passenger transport. And when we think about you know, how can we avoid travel for, for passengers? How can we shift passengers to different modes? How can we improve our vehicle technologies again for, for different passenger modes? But we can think of this for, for freight vehicles too, right? Um, so let's try to walk through these three uh, categories of, of uh, solutions in terms of freight transport. So when we talk about avoiding freight movements, uh, you know, we might think of, oh, we need to not get the goods to where people need them, but that's a very difficult uh, approach, but it's not inconceivable. But that's why I actually put, it, put this line in, in, in my slide. So maybe we can consider reducing com consumption. Of course, people need their goods. We need to uh, sustain lives and, and, and livelihoods and so on. Um, but maybe reducing consumption might be might be an option. We could potentially reconfigure supply chains and source more locally, such, such that the goods don't have to travel such long distances. Or you could have distribution uh, distributed production again, making sure that uh, production happens closer to where they are consumed, so that I don't have to travel so many ton kilometers. Right? I'm trying to reduce ton kilometers. Uh, this is a more systemic change. It requires you know a lot of. Uh, uh, forward planning and, and thinking in order to achieve that. Um, from a planning perspective, we could locate our uh, freight related facilities more optimally. You know, where, where should we be the best place to site them? Where should our warehouses and depots be? Where can we site our parking facilities so that we again reduce this kilometers driven by, by, by uh, our freight vehicles? We could have parcel lockers so that um, instead of the delivery person uh, making the delivery to, to, to the doorstep or to a household, maybe the passenger makes that trip instead. Um, you could have smart systems or physical internet systems to manage or share infrastructure use. So if it's congested, you know, can we use um, data or information to the users to avoid uh, peak hour arrivals, such as, you know, curb spaces, maybe we can re reserve them in advance. Or same for loading bays, you could you could try them out. So we had some trials in, in Singapore to do this. We could share the transport capacity. So just like in passenger transport, we carpool, we share rides. For logistics too, maybe we can have you know multiple companies sharing a single vehicle or single a space within a single vehicle. So collaborative logistics comes in, or more efficient routing as a whole in order to improve system efficiency and then again reduce these these kilometers. So let me give you an example over here. So this was a study that we did with the local uh, land planning authority that was looking at long-term planning for parking of these trucks in, in the city. So Singapore has these open air parking lots where uh, it's dedicated to, to these like larger, heavier vehicles that don't have a place to, to park overnight. Um, but given the uh, land scarcity and and um, you know the demand for, for land, right? So we want to free up the space potentially for, for other users. 
So what we did was we developed an agent-based simulation to evaluate um, how changes in parking allocation might influence uh, how, how vehicles move around. So we have a baseline scenario where we have uh, 42,000 parking spaces in many different locations uh, all over the city. Uh, these are hypothetical scenarios, but you know the model was meant to evaluate possibilities. Um, and then you could have another scenario where, okay, let's maybe move these parking lots closer to industrial activity where they tend to pick up and drop off goods anyway, right? Um, but this could also mean that these trucks would be making maybe uh, you know, travel longer dis distances depending on the relationships that they have with other firms located within the city. So the simulation had to account for you know, firm locations, relationships between firms, and, and um, you know, how, how they tend to uh, uh, plan their, their routing and uh, the goods deliveries throughout, throughout the day. So in the scenario two, the shift to industrial areas involved consolidating some of these parking lots and then shifting the capacity closer to the west. So, so that's where most of the industrial activity uh, is taking place. So some of the, the results over here, we find that of course we'll have some benefits, uh, frees up the land for other users, uh, but we, and then we also see reduced traffic uh, near the downtown or commercial business district, as well as in the east. However, the total number of vehicle kilometers traveled was observed to be higher with some of this reallocation of, of parking spaces. So this helps, I think, city planners think a bit more about facility locations and how that impacts uh, overall um, uh, goals of, of reducing traffic or um, reducing emissions. So the next category of solutions surround shift. Uh, so this is where we try to avoid or move away from more, uh, you know, uh, more polluting modes to more environmentally friendly modes and improve trip efficiency. So while the previous avoid looked at system level efficiencies, we're looking at trip efficiencies on the vehicle or trip level. So we're going to move um, away for, for freight, where I'm interpreting this to be, you know, shifting away from diesel vehicles to other modes like waterways or rail, if available in, in, in your city. Uh, it's not available in Singapore, unfortunately. Uh, or smaller modes uh, like cargo cycles, or electric, electric, smaller electric vehicles, drones potentially, although I think drones is a, has a very niche application area that's good for more remote um, areas uh, rather than you know, sending out a, a, a diesel, a conventional diesel, diesel vehicle. Or right size vehicles, right? If you have a truck that you're driving half empty most of the time, then you know, maybe that, that, that isn't the right size for your particular business. So maybe guiding, providing some guidance for that. Uh, the second idea is an integrating passenger and freight transport. So this has been entertained in, in a few places. So this is where we have passenger transport capacity in either individual cars, uh, passenger cars, or it could be on public transport. Um, uh, you know, if we can find a way to share that capacity, I think that that would be interesting. Um, other operational improvements. So I usually when I present this, I start from like the harder, the harder ones, the more higher level ones down to the uh, lower level options that we have. Uh, we have operational improvements to reduce, um, uh, again, vehicle kilometers traveled, EKT, or maybe we can promote anti-idling, platooning between uh, across vehicles. So these are ways to make the trip more efficient. Actually, I should put driver education, right? That, that, that might be another one where if drivers drive more eco-friendly driving without, yeah, without being too aggressive, that could be another way to make the trip more efficient. So here's one example. We tried to look at uh, cargo cycles. So this are, these are smaller vehicle modes compared to tra the traditional uh, delivery van. And then um, you could potentially uh, re replace this if, if possible. Although this idea didn't really pick up in Singapore, this, we worked with this startup called Rital that uh, tried to bring it to Singapore, but it didn't, didn't really quite, quite work out. Um, but when we modeled the potential benefits, uh, we, we, we tried to look at the, the demand density that can sustain the replacement of diesel delivery vans for these smaller vehicles because they have, the, the capacity is a bit different. Uh, the, there's also a weight limit associated with, with these vehicles. So we tried to see you know, whether um, the, the num number of uh, deliveries per square kilometer had an impact on whether or not these can be, can be effective. So we did demonstrate potential for reducing travel time, uh, as, uh, the, the delivery time, as well as the vehicle kilometers travel, um, depending on the different uh, demand density in terms of deliveries per square kilometer 
um, for the different simulations. Yeah. Another idea is, is, is crowd shipping. So this is where we get members of the public to make their deliveries uh, along their journey. So you might envision picking up a parcel from uh, a parcel locker or making the deliveries. This concept is very similar to like crowdsourcing. So instead of crowdsourcing uh, some other services, you're crowdsourcing the service of uh, transporting. So people, uh, again, there's been quite a few studies looking at this idea for use uh, where, where drivers could do that uh, along their journeys. But, we're, but in our case, we're looking at the, using public transportation. Um, this is because we observe things like the bottom left picture shows a, a typical public bus in Singapore during off-peak hours. So see, lots of room, might be, have some room for, for parcels or for passengers to hang on to parcels. Um, so we were fortunate to get some data from an e-commerce carrier. And if we observe the daily parcel uh, trajectories from a single warehouse on the top right, and then we look up, again, observe you know, the bus, public bus passenger volumes from that vicinity, uh, that, that warehouse origin, we can see, hey, you know, there are lots of people moving around the city and then we can potentially make them, uh, get them to work and, and then uh, earn some money during their, their, journey, their journeys. So this study looked at the potential benefits of crowd shipping using public transport. We had to do some surveys to get a sense of how willing people are to serve as crowd shippers and then um, allocate or match the parcels with passengers and then route the, the vehicles for the remaining uh, remaining uh, parcels that are not allocated. So overall, I think we were able to demonstrate some benefit. I think uh, in, in our models, we saw about 10% of the um, parcels could be redirected away from, uh, again, uh, that a dedicated commercial vehicle fleet to make these deliveries to uh, leaving it to public transport passengers to, to fulfill. Um, yeah, so some potential over here. And the final set is um, final set of solutions around improving. So this is the one that we're most familiar with, with when we think of, okay, low carbon freight transport, what can we do? We can electrify vehicles using, uh, uh, and, uh, using ideally using cleaner electricity or uh, using low emissions hydrogen. Um, so one study that we did was to look at life cycle assessment of electric versus uh, hydrogen fuel cell trucks versus a conventional diesel truck. Uh, in Singapore. So we looked at a mid-sized vehicle. We had to account for uh, all life cycle stages up, upstream, including the material production that goes into the battery manufacturing, um, the, the fuel production, uh, uh, where we source the electricity from, or where we source the hydrogen production uh, from, and, and so on. So um, here are some results. I want to go a bit quickly to leave some time at the end for, for questions. So we find that, of course, um, decarbonizing the fuel aspects, fuel production aspects is critical. We cannot just roll out electric vehicles without greening our grid. If otherwise, the, the benefit would not be so, so evident. So energy in the use phase was a, a dominant part of the overall life cycle emissions impact. So um, the, again, the cleaner the grid, I think the, the more advantages we can get. This study looked at different payload levels. So the horizontal bars here are the different powertrain types. We have the conventional diesel on, on, on the left, and then we have a hybrid, battery electric vehicle, fuel cell vehicles, and, and so on. And they're all, um, the life cycle greenhouse emissions on the, in these bars measured in kilograms of CO2 equivalent per ton kilometer is split up into the different life cycle phases, like the use phase, fuel production, and, and so on. So when we compare the battery electric vehicle with the diesel vehicle, you can see that uh, across the different payloads, levels for, for the vehicle. It's not, um, it, the, the, the reductions are there, not so obvious at all times, it varies a bit. So it seems like a marginal, uh, quite a marginal benefit. Uh, much of the uncertainty arises from this battery production and replacement intervals that might be needed uh, in, these, in these vehicles. So mixed results. Um, if we were to look at fuel cell trucks in Singapore, uh, most of the Hydrogen now is, is, is produced by steam methane reforming, which you know it's not exactly the clean, this is gray, gray hydrogen, right? So um, it's not exactly the, the cleanest, cleanest, but if we had more opportunities to have uh, the use of uh, you know, uh, blue hydrogen or maybe green hydrogen, I think the, the story would, would look a bit better. So as of right now, we're, we, we don't have the option, even though the technologies are being tested. Um, so again, this, development of the fuel production side has to accompany the vehicle production. Yeah. 
So here's the framework that I, I presented. We want to avoid, shift, improve different ways to reduce overall freight uh, emissions. Uh, but I want to mention two more things before I, I wrap up. That I think there are two other aspects of freight uh, carbon emissions that we should also consider. There is also embodied carbon uh, in the vehicles or in the infrastructure that we plan to, uh, we need to, to, to develop in order to accommodate freight movement. So this is something that should not be neglected as well. Well, more, most of the conversation uh, discussion so far has been on uh, the vehicles themselves, but the infrastructure too has, has impact. And then consumer behavior, I want, I want to revisit that because it's not just about uh, what the industry and the, and, and the stakeholders can do, but also maybe some of the decisions that consumers make can drive some of this, uh, some of the reduction. Mm. So here's a picture of um, a vision of future mobility in Singapore. So this is a very, very nice, I, I like this picture a lot because it shows, it, it's a bit like a, not really where's Wally, but when you, when you look at the details, you start noticing some of the intentions that they have. So this is a, a vision of a high-rise living alongside with uh, access to transport options uh, close by. And it's a very livable environment because most of the open space is dedicated to uh, move, uh, like a pedestrian movement rather than vehicles. So the vehicles are allocated to one level down and then further down, we have some logistics facilities, which is very nice to see in this, in this vision. So you have parcel lockers, if you look carefully. I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but there are parcel lockers over here. At the bottom right, uh, there are some automated vehicles making deliveries over here. Um, and then at the very bottom, you have this uh, subway system running down there, right? So um, while it's, a, again, a very nice, very nice picture, very well, well organized, there's a lot of embodied carbon in the concrete and steel and all that that has to go into building these three, four levels of underground uh, facilities. So that, again, something to, to consider for, for on, a, on a city level. And that's why I'm so interested in the topic of uh, metabolism now, which tracks resource flows into cities, which are resource sinks. Um, the other aspect was to look at consumer behavior. So let me wrap this up quickly, because uh, uh, again, I want to give time for questions, lots of good questions. We have um, one study that I did with a student was to look at the carbon emissions associated with shipping your online order. So this was uh, quite interesting. We, we presented some options. Uh, we did a shipping choice experiment where we presented some options to, to people to see whether they're willing to sacrifice maybe delivery time, the speed of the deliveries, or um, cost of delivery with lower carbon options. So we labeled some options as a, a greener one, and we presented to, it to them and see how they might choose differently or not. Um, it was quite interesting. I mean, this involved first estimating the carbon impact for the different shipping options. I think when you shop online, you have, you know, this is a faster delivery or a next day delivery, or, you know, you could wait seven days or something like that. Um, and then you kind of have the different uh, carbon emissions associated with those options. And then if you uh, labeled it accordingly, how, how might people respond? So out of the respondents, we found that more than half, slightly more than half are willing to compromise the speed for the lower carbon option, which is quite interesting. Uh, and then a quarter of them were willing to pay more actually for the greener option. Most people want the lowest cost, right? The cost will be the dominant uh, decision, um, the, uh, the, the dominant factor affecting the, 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 the decision. Um, so this was this this encouraged us to think that you know I think consumers, if had some more information or control, might be willing to make some changes to their behavior in order to reduce overall carbon emissions. So this is uh, yeah, my last slide. I think uh, moving forward, uh, again, very fascinating space. We will be spending more time looking at city scale freight analysis. Um, these are some of the topics that is either ongoing or something that we are planning. So I welcome collaborators or students that are potentially interested in developing some of these topics together with, with us. Um, the key takeaways, uh, freight emissions is growing. We have to counter that growth, uh, but there are options to reduce it. And other, aside from technologies, we have options to improve system and trip efficiencies. And maybe this topic of consumer behavior can also be impactful. So thank, and I wanted to thank our, our sponsors. So most of them are the local government agencies that uh, are very interested in some of the national uh, Singapore issues that we have here. So thank you so much for listening. And um, I, I hope I left enough time for answering some of the questions that you have. Um, well, yeah, thank you very much. I was a very education online in presentation. I have to admit I have not thought very very much about the pride, but I will start doing it from now on. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of the, the chat book has been very active and I think uh, your student and uh, Ellie have been very active also in answering some of the questions. So 
Uh, let me start uh, with the last one from one of the last ones from Deborah. So she says that she's been inter like uh, interested for a long time in figuring out how to reduce empty trucks. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be like a win-win strategy, but it's elusive somehow. So uh, mm -hmm. one explanation is that it's intense competition in the freight movement industry makes it hard for them to share shipment. So do you have any thoughts or reactions regarding that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's an interesting one, and uh, you know, sort of reminds me like we need an Uber for freight, right, or something like that, where you can share capacities across. And there, there have been some startups uh, going to this space. I haven't seen uh, many of them having like a hit application and getting. Um, the challenge with businesses and firms is that they usually have very tight constraints on their deliveries and you know scheduling requirements and so on, and and very heterogeneous, heterogeneous, right? So uh, a different industry type. Could have very different needs compared to one, you know, than another one. So I think it's about finding, being able to find find these matches and also solve this issue of, you know, this capacity that's unused, right? That we observe around around the city. Okay, thank you. I have a, a, another question that is actually connected to one of the things that you mentioned in the end about Amazon same day. So mm -hmm. I was just asking at that point, like about last my delivery and consumer behavior, right? So I was wondering if these services like Amazon actually affect negatively emissions you want the package the next day so you probably have to do a more inefficient route or like if consumers were to wait for like five or six you know sometimes you know you don't need that anything Urgency. Like, right you know, right yeah sometimes we do but most of the time we don't, so we don't right so <laughs> that actually affects emissions yeah it does it does so it's exactly like you said right if they didn't have time to sort of you know share that right with another parcel or you know uh, dedicate uh, you know other sh again sh uh, share the capacity then I think the, uh, or basically it's, um, no chance to consolidate, right? Then it will be a dedicated trip just to fulfill that that, that very urgent de delivery. So whereas if we had more time, then they could optimize their route by planning more carefully, consolidate with other parcels, yeah. Um, but, but, but lots of other ideas around it, right? Like the use of parcel lockers or maybe crowd shipping, like, like I, I mentioned, you know, these, these could potentially help as well. Okay, so have these have these effects been quantified? Like the one day, same day delivery, same day delivery, yeah. like this percentage. Yeah, no, I haven't. I think it's very um, company specific too, right? It depends on the specific uh, setup, the current setup, and how. I think I think these um, large, like retailers online, also try to optimize it, right? So they sort of predict the demand and make sure that they allocate it closer to. To where the consumption is going to be they could have like more urban warehouses so that's also popping up but that's a very interesting um land planning sort of issue as well yeah. okay so ali has a question about how to reduce emissions so he asks what do you think about the effectiveness of devices like fms so fleet, fleet management system in freight transportation yeah yeah i think that's good uh, again i also observed that some of the smaller companies have not yet adopted these available very readily available technologies right uh, these like one vehicle firms that I, that I spoke of may not be in a position to, if these are very small firms, they may not be in a position to adopt uh, the use of this, but it can help them optimize their routes. Uh, but again, it comes back to the same concern, uh, Ellie, that I mentioned about how individually we have firms optimizing their routes. Some of them not yet, but you know, if, even if we do get everyone to optimize their routes, as a whole, it's not optimized, right? So uh, you could have two, 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 two vans coming up to the same destination, but you know, they could have consolidated. Why didn't they? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going up a little bit to a, a earlier question from Ellie. So I'm not sure where this is coming from, but uh, which slide was referring to, but it says, did you also observe shift from patrol, patrol powered light commercial heavy vehicles to diesel powered? So mm -hmm. it was the case in Australia in 2009, gradually light commercial vehicles became diesel powered. So mm -hmm. the implication we perhaps less fuel consumption, less CO2, but more criteria pollutants. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So that there will be a trade-off, right? And depending on the, if you're looking for clean air as opposed to carbon emissions, I think that's also yeah. a different uh, different metric to, to to measure and so on. But but you know, but I think I think the conversation now is not so much which fossil fuel to use, but it's when can we electrify? So can, when can we move away to, to electric trucks ideally? Yeah. Okay. Um, are there, if there are other questions, please uh, pop them in, write them in the chat. Um, uh, I have another it's a personal. Again, I'm a beginner in this subject, so I'm not. I don't know uh, much. But in the context, when you discuss efficiency, how does like, like a human factor um, it, it's accounted for? Because Amazon has been criticized a lot because now they're using AI to to optimize their, their schedules, and then like this is just like not humanly feasible to do schedules. And even in Japan, like uh, a lot of people are trying to switch to the 
So like, you know, the, the gig economy, right? And at the beginning, before AI was in, introduced, they said like they actually made a lot of money, relatively a lot of money, right? But now that mm -hmm. AI is optimized, they just get any free time and it's just, apparently mm -hmm. it's not a humanly feasible uh, mm -hmm. business. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you brought up that point because it's also about the, the different stakeholders that are affected. There's also social implications of, of uh, I think, freight, freight transport, right? The workers involved and uh, um, making sure that they're taken care of. Um, although a lot of our, our work models, you know, the, the, the feasibility of solutions and all that, I think we do have to take the time sometimes to consult the stakeholders also to understand the perspectives and, and what, what some of the concerns there. Put that into the, the modeling, all right? Or, or at least consider it in, in the questions if not it'll be a very um like data driven data itself doesn't always tell us a full yeah. story yeah so some of the actually some of my the research that i do also works with with uh, i also work with psychologists so we do a lot of uh, surveys about uh, so we recently did a, a project looking at autonomous vehicles and, and it actually was i think it was in a, in a btr conference yeah we looked at um acceptance of public acceptance of autonomous vehicles and then we okay. consulted uh, not only the passengers that will be taking rides in these vehicles, but also the workers, so, so the drivers that are, might be affected by the, the use of self-driving cars in, in cities. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any, any other questions? Uh, let's see. Uh, hey, if Giancarlos, and I, I, maybe Ellie can answer this question, but I had heard that in Australia, they might be going to a hybrid vehicle that is all electric. <sighs> Oh, there's my dog. <laughs> it's all electric um, when it penetrates the city, when it starts getting close to lungs, and then it, it goes to like a natural gas or something in for the long distances between the regions. Do you think that might happen? are you asking me <laughs> well, well anybody yeah i think that i heard about it in the context of australia but it you know and singapore is so tiny i just think they won't yeah in, in, in singapore our distances are very short so we don't have the long haul to, to, to concern about but yeah it does it's, it's very interesting when it sounds like they're trying to deal with the clean air issue in the city center and then you know at the same time making sure to be able to overcome range limits uh, outside the city um, yeah, so, uh, Carl, I think every state in Australia has its own policy, but uh, with the change of the government, I think some of these initiatives and some of these talks might happen uh, at least sooner than uh, what I could expect, like last year. Um, but in Australia, we have a challenge here, and it's the long distances that um, we utilize also very bigger trucks, like uh, monstrous trucks. I'm, I'm sure, Cara, that in your visit, you've seen those B double, A, A double uh, trucks. And electrifying those trucks um, is a, is a big challenge so for instance when it comes to like uh delivery urban delivery uh in the cbd area then commercial vans that it, it, they could they can be utilized and i'm sure that uh, they will be electrified very soon so for instance um i was talking to um um, a delivery uh, company which is the biggest one after australian post and they are now transitioning towards um, hybrid vans, as you mentioned, for the urban deliveries, as well as electric uh, small trucks. Uh, but then when it comes to long haul, then um, because, you know, the productivity, then they need bigger trucks, bigger powertrain, then it needs bigger batteries, bigger batteries, then uh, uh, have already lots of load limitation on the road because of the impact on the pavement and so on. So there are lots of, uh, you know, weighing motion sensors that they have to check, um, idling um, the trucks for you know, charging time. And um, yes, but um, the good news, uh, actually, I heard that uh, there's a manufacturer, truck manufacturer in Queensland that uh, they are putting, um, they're actually electrifying the trailer as well. So not just the, um, the prime mover, uh, the trailer as well. So it could be uh, one of the exciting, uh, I mean, exciting technologies. <coughs> Excuse me. Is there something you want to add to that, Lynette? No, I think that, uh, thanks, thanks, Ellie, for sharing. 
Yeah, Ellie, we hope you and your husband feel better right away. And we know you're about to start that other Zoom room. Giancarlos, thank you so much for keeping this Zoom room open. And Lynette, thank you for being a part of this. We'll be sharing your slides with hundreds of people and, um, and, and, and this recording as well. Uh, but the slides will go up first. Great, yeah, thanks Thanks so much for again, putting this together. And also thank you to Li Wei for answering the questions online. <laughs> Yeah, that was a very efficient combination there, right? <laughs> um, so that means we actually can finish perfectly on time, talking about efficiency. So mm -hmm. again, Lynette, thank you for this amazing presentation. And please stay for, uh, if you're staying for the personality traits and, and discrete choice models, you can stay in this room. If you're going to another session, then please refer to the program to find the Zoom link. Again, thank you for joining. Thanks. Bye.